The Forgotten History of Humanity Before the Deluge, Part 2. Hello, my name's Lizzie Caron, and welcome to the channel I've created on my dreams of Atlantis. This episode is the second part of the story of humanity that I've pieced together from my regressions to Tantal, otherwise known as Atlantis. The previous episode was all about how humanity developed over the first 300,000 years and about the founding of Atlantis. As I discussed, the first and greatest leader of Atlantis was Uran. And we cover all the things achieved at that time and of course the eventual downfall of Uran after about 9,300 years of rule. An interesting side note was that at this stage, Tantau was in a fairly temperate zone, whereas much of the rest of the world was going through an uncomfortably cold spell. In fact, the earth was fairly heavily covered with snow and glaciers. This weather situation continued through the reign of Uran and into the reign of Belar. So now I'm going to talk about the time of Belar. Belar took over as leader in about 25,280 BC. With the overthrow of Uran and the takeover by Belar of Kron came law changes. The people were free to have as many children as they wanted. They were free to travel and to interfere in the lives of the primitives and even have relations with them free to exchange any knowledge whatsoever between institutions and free to do whatever scientific things that had previously been deemed immoral. So you can see the laws of Uran versus the laws of Bela to understand the differences. Some of the universities feared what would happen next and immediately declared independence from Tantau but most of the others were centralised by Bela, i.e. they were swallowed up under the umbrella of the great institution of Tandel. Only Phoebe and Kem were allowed to continue in their existing location outside of Tandel. The population in Tandel grew and grew. Well, it continued to be a fabulous place to live for quite a long time, but slowly it became more and more dog-eat-dog -dog and corrupt. People had many children, and those children grew up and had more children. Massive exponential population growth, because the population had a, an unlimited lifespan. More people meant more demand for resources, land, energy, education, food, etc. The concept of money was necessary and was introduced because it had to be. It was theoretically in order to ensure a fair distribution of resources in return for a person's contribution to society. But in reality, it provided mechanisms for greater corruption. Power and wealth could now be achieved and materialism was suddenly highly fashionable. The full 120-year process of education was abandoned and only those that could pay were fully educated. People were travelling to wherever they wanted to around the world. They were openly associating with primitives. Some were having relations with primitives and even brought primitives back to Tantal to live. But there was at least some strict controls around doing so. Over time, the majority of wealth moved into the hands of the few. Atlantis had previously considered everyone as equal, but now it was stratified. The number of anti-aging devices in storage when Uran left seemed to be so large that it could never run out, but it started to deplete quickly. They soon became only something the rich could afford. People would have children, but their children would not be able to have the anti-aging cure, which was quite distressing for many people. Without Uran, there would be no more cure 
other than that from the devices and plants they already had. If a person already had a device, they had to guard it well, and they were unable to share it. It could, however, be taken off them. The focus of Uran's work while in exile was protection for those that had joined him and to be absolutely sure that Bella's people would not be able to find him. He knew that with overpopulation, the stocks of the cure would soon be depleted and they would come looking for him. He was determined that they would not find him. He was right. If they had found him, it would have been trouble for him. With the increased demand for resources, things went from bad to worse for the people of Tantel. Admittedly, it took thousands of years or so. The rule of Bela and his cohorts lasted almost 7,000 years, but by the time the revolution or civil war occurred, the whole civilization was already in a state of disarray, the primary cause being the increased population and the demands it placed on society. The revolution was brutal. It was a terrible 10 years of internal conflict, the details of which I will leave for a separate episode. The end result was Bella of Kron left Tantau and went to live with the primitives in a place that is now known as Italy. Bella felt the weight of guilt upon him for overthrowing Uran and putting his people in this terrible position and thus leaving the door open for a leader like Jepe. As a side note, Bella did eventually reconcile with his father, but that's also another story. So the end of the revolution came suddenly when Bella was gone. It was approximately 18,500 BC when he went. The instigator of the revolution was elated. At last his time had come, and that is when Jepe stepped up into the role of leader. This new ruler was a true dictator, and his reign lasted over 8,000 years. The first 6,000 years of his rule was just an ordinary type of unpleasant. But then, quite suddenly, his mental health fell into a serious decline, and the people truly suffered. Tantal was not the place it was, by any stretch of the imagination, but they still had some amazing technology and some good people. The only universities remaining from the early days were the Institute of Celestial Movement in Phoebe, the Great Institute in Tantal, um, the Medical Institute in Tantal, the Institute of Applied Energy in Chem, and the Institute for Enjoyment, also in Tantau. Although I don't think they were having a lot of enjoyment. The great machines and some of the technology of Uran no longer functioned, but the scientists developed other technologies, some of which bridged the gaps, and others which were, well, not really very safe, but that's also another story. There were way too many people, and so to maintain the standard of living for the elite, the island rings of Tantal were graded by class hierarchy. The central ring was for Jepe and his elite, the middle ring for the scientists and the people who achieved the more intellectual of things, the outer ring was for the ordinary workers and the poor, and the plains were for the farmers, and um, that's where most of the food was grown. The weather continued without too much variation for about a thousand years, and then things started to happen that affected the climate. There were more earthquakes, um, the temperatures got warmer, and sea levels started to rise. This impacted many of the coastal areas, including the beautiful village the Tantals had come from originally, called Kron, and it was taken.
taken over by the sea. But many of the areas where the primitive lived were also disrupted in this manner. Fortunately, Tantal was sufficiently elevated for it not to be impacted, at least not at this stage. Life continued in Tantal and a kind of normality set in. But the water levels started rising more from about um, 19,000 BC as the ice melted from the north. Note, please, it's likely to to have something to do with the scientists of Tantel, but I can't be 100% sure. Anyway, then in about 14,500 BC, the level suddenly increased even more rapidly. The scientists were at a loss to know what to do, and Jepe really didn't care. By this time, his mental health was showing signs of extreme abnormality, not that anyone ever dare mention it to him. So he'd reached a point where he now expected total devotion from his people, and he held that devotion with the steel grip of his police force. His police force, or maybe you'd call them military, were unsurpassed. This group of elite fighters were very strong and rather interesting. And how they came about, well, that's another story. Gosh, if I were to tell all the stories in one go, this would be hours and hours long. Anyway, his ambition was to take over and rule all the primitives bit by bit eventually ruling the world. So first he built up his military force, as I mentioned, to the level he required, and then he invaded or took over the areas nearest to Tantal. Then um, it grew to being the whole of the coast uh, of coastal Africa. Then he took over what would be known as today as coastal Arabia. And this was at a time when water levels were still rising and each generation of the primitives were forced to move further and further inland. Anyway, as it was his desire to be worshipped as a god, um, that was his driving force. And so he used whatever techniques he could to convince the primitives of his godliness. And it was this activity towards the end of his reign, about 12,000 BC, that pushed many of the Tantals into leaving Tantal. He even (laughs) had a really lavish celebration um, to announce his newly found godliness. And uh, that really was a step too far. Some even risking their lives just to get out of Tantal. And this angered Jepe even more. Most of those who escaped went to join Bela, or they went to Neath, um, an area which is now known uh, as Athens in Greece, and uh, it had been one of the universities in the days of Uran, and it was still under his protection. As Jepe's forces grew, he conquered more locations, He converted fighters from the place that he'd conquered and he got them to fight for him. Eventually, he decided to move his force towards the areas where the escaped Tantals had gone. His forces began to attack the Mediterranean by sea through the Straits of Gibraltar, working eastwards. It was about 11,570 BC when the force reached the northern part of the area now known today as Italy and the people of Tantal who'd escaped to that area decided that they really needed to join forces to defend themselves so no matter if they had been supporters of Uran or Bela or even those who at one time or another followed Jepe, it had gone too far, so they had to join forces. Uran even came out of retirement to provide mechanisms and technology for defense of the area. 
Tantal, or Atlantis, attacked Neith, or what is now known as Athens. But try as they may, everything the army of Jippe threw at Neith bounced back onto them with the same force they'd intended it for Neith. Jippe was undeterred, sending one group after another into battle with, with essentially themselves. I, I say they were battling with themselves because um, the cooperative did nothing but use the technology Uran had provided to deflect their force back to them. So essentially they were just attacking themselves. Angry and defeated, Jepe withdrew what was left of his forces. So by 11,565 BC, the war was over. Jepe had only intended to withdraw temporarily and return again with greater force, but other things conspired to prevent that from ever happening. He planned to focus on how to defeat the technology that was causing him so much annoyance. He had his teams of scientists working, but they had no idea what the technology actually was that they were supposed to be negating. All they knew was that if they sent a bomb to their enemy, it would miraculously bomb them, the people who were attacking. They had no idea where to start. And many of them were fighting amongst themselves rather than actually working together. As for Jepe, he continued to encourage the scientists in his own unique way, which was anger, followed by tantrums, and then dead scientists. He used other nasty dictatorial techniques as well, but nothing worked. It was really hard to get progress from dead scientists. Hence the saying, there is no point in flogging a dead scientist. Eventually he pulled in his horns on war and focused on getting as much adoration as any god could handle from the people who didn't know any better, the primitives. But uh, that too is another story. The people who remained in Tantal were also required to worship him and they felt trapped and totally terrified of the unpredictable Jepe. But it certainly uh, fixed the problem of overpopulation. Many people died at the whim of Jepe and those who didn't had no desire whatsoever to have children at that time. Conditions within Tantal continued to get worse. Temples for the worship of Jepe within Tantal were constructed everywhere and they became the key mechanisms for enforced suffering of the people. The women around Jepe tried to influence him to be kinder to his people, but it just made him more controlling and more angry. Then one day, the scientists came to Jepe with news that would change the world forever. In about 10,800 BC, a series of asteroid collision events were expected by the scientists, and they were of such a serious nature that the scientists were extremely concerned, and they started to focus their energies in that direction. But should they have told Jepe? Probably no. This series of large asteroids were on a collision path with Earth and Jepe was in denial. He ordered the scientists to continue to focus on the technology to defeat Neith. But they knew how serious the threat really was. The first few that came our way were successfully deflected despite Jepe's orders to the contrary. The scientists of Phoebe had done very well to prevent disaster, but Jepe would not tolerate such insolence, and so the scientists that had saved the world at that time were put to death as dissidents. This meant that the scientists that stepped up into the shoes of the dead scientists 
did not have the experience with the problem at hand. So when the next threat presented itself, the new lead scientists tried to deflect as the, uh, in the same way that the deceased scientists had done before them. Once again, they worked on it contrary to the directives given by Japay, knowing that they would most likely be killed either by way of impact or by Japay. So they persisted, but their lack of expertise resulted in a very small miscalculation. The deflection worked, but not enough, and parts of the asteroid struck, or should I say skimmed, Antarctica, like a thrown stone skims a pond. The earth trembled. There were eruptions around the world, like bottles of fizzy water that had just been shaken and opened up at the same time, and the world plunged into a small ice age that would last 1,500 years. Atlantis was badly damaged. But that is not how Atlantis or Tantal was destroyed. But this destruction was soon to come. This destruction came in a way that I think is called a perfect storm, when things just line up in a way that makes the end result even more terrible. Tantal was in disarray, internal fighting, petty disputes between the leaders, many of which were just trying to protect the scientists that remained. But combine that with continued small impact events and air bursts, all of which would have been quite manageable at the time if the scientists had been permitted to live long enough to work together. As I'd mentioned, Many of the dangers had been deflected sufficiently to cause minimal damage. But then another impact that had not been sufficiently defect deflected hit. This time it was a big one, and it hit in an area that already had elevated ice levels. The result was a tsunami so terrible, it wiped out completely the area Tantal had been. And when the water receded, all that remained was mud. Tantal or Atlantis had been vaporized. It's not actually clear to me in my dreams if it was the impact that caused the tsunami or the earthquakes that followed the impact that caused the tsunami. But one might say that is academic. But there weren't really very many academics left to argue the point. Anyway, back to the tsunami. From above, it looked like a giant hard bristled broom had swept the area clean. Hard to describe, really. But it was not submerged as much as it was just gone. Uran and his followers had some backup plans for saving as many of the animals, people and plants as possible. But that's another story. Right, well, we've got past the very sad part. So this great civilization was decimated, damaged and then obliterated. Bang, bang, bang. First decimated by the internal degradation, war, and megalomanic stupidity of the leader. Then damaged by events leading to a sudden ice age. And finally obliterated by the inability to protect themselves from further impact events due to the lack of of expertise that was remaining. As for survivors, human survivors fell into several categories. The primitives who were fortunate enough to survive naturally. The primitives who were helped to survive. The Atlanteans who had already left 
Atlantis or Tantal before this all happened. And the few who miraculously escaped just before it happened. The people living in Tantal at that time, most of them, they tried to get away when they knew the tsunami was coming. But only a few managed to escape. When Japay and his closest cohorts realized it was all over, they immediately went into a bunker deep within the earth that they'd built in the center island. What happened to them after all the devastation is another story. But I promise I will do more episodes that will cover what happened to the survivors and where they went. So, very sad, very, very sad. But that's the end of part two. This completes the lost history of humanity up to the point of the deluge. Please subscribe and click on the bell icon if you do want to be notified of the arrival of any new episodes. And I am going to try to make my next episodes a little bit lighter, a little bit happier, maybe even a little bit funny, because I don't think I can do another episode as sad and depressing as that one. But hopefully I'll see you guys next time.